Hello, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about Ghidra. And if you're not familiar with Ghidra, we'll break it down. Um, but the main core of it is talking about plugin development and how we can actually automate a lot of the things that reverse engineers do every day. Uh, so that's, that's the official title. It'll be fun, I promise. Uh, so first, who I am. Uh, my name is Jacob Latonis. Uh, I'm a staff software engineer on the threat research team at Proofpoint. Uh, I currently reside in Boulder, Colorado. And when I'm not working, uh, what I do for fun is I run, I read, I hike, uh, and then I contribute to open source development uh, with things like Yara X and, and some other fun stuff. Um, I also cycle now. Since uh, I've made these slides, I've, I've bought a gravel bike and have been uh, cycling a lot of the gravel trails in Colorado. Uh, as for the agenda today, we're going to start with plugins and why, why we should use them, what they are, the benefits. Uh, we're going to dive into the ecosystem. So kind of just get the lay of the land of what we need to know to go into Ghidra plugins, uh, the possibilities and use cases that we'll break down, uh, writing the actual plugin, and then a little bit more. And then before we start, uh, I do want to give a disclaimer that we'll discuss a whole lot of stuff here today. Not every topic has the time or focus to be fully completed and discussed in 30 or so minutes. Uh, if you're curious on what the full plugin implementation looks like while we're talking through this, this is available on my GitHub. Uh, it's just github.com slash Latonis, uh, and then it's GB Analyzer. Um, and it's also licensed under the Apache 2.0 license just to remain consistent with what Ghidra is licensed as. And then, so if you're not familiar with Ghidra, uh, it's an open source reverse engineering toolkit. It's developed by the NSA because IDA costs, I think, at least a billion dollars a license. Uh, it's highly extensible and customizable. So the nice thing about it being written in Java, and the one nice thing, is that with Java, you can actually implement features from other parts of the code, or you can overwrite things and gain new behaviors without re-implementing all of it. Uh, it's, it's really nice, and we'll actually pull some of that in to work on the UI for our stuff. Um, and it's also free. Uh, a lot of the RE friends that I have, we will get into you know, semi-arguments about which one people should use, because everyone in our field is very opinionated. Uh, and they'll, you know, like Binja, Binary Ninja, or Ida Pro, or what have you. But the nice thing about Ghidra is that the barrier to entry is very low. It's free. So anyone can download it and start playing around and, and doing anything with it, which is really nice. Uh, and that's why I decided to focus on Ghidra instead of another one that's a, a paid license. So getting started, uh, the first thing I wanted to break down was the Ghidra architecture. So this isn't all encompassing, but it is the parts that we need to know. Uh, so starting out, the core platform, the first thing is the flat API. So basically, the developers actually did a really nice thing. And instead of you having to know all of the modules where the fun parts of the API exist, they basically wrote a flat API abstraction that allows you access to all of the things that they thought were cool and important. And we're going to leverage that today. Uh, there's also extensible components, like we've talked about with Java. Uh, and then there's the decompiler and disassembler. And that's the main platform. Like If you use Ghidra, you'll interact with those things through the GUI, through the, uh, the scripting language, everything like that. Um, there's also scripting. So scripting is different from plugins, and I'm going to dive into it a little bit more in the next slides. Um, but scripting is you can write it in Java, or you can write it in Python, and it's get from point A to point B. So if you've written a Python script to like parse something or extract something, that's, that's what a uh, Ghidra script can do. Um, it's just nice automations that, that you can run whenever you uh, would like to. There's export modules. Uh, export modules are, I have this bit of data in Ghidra, and I would like to get it out into something else. Uh, and then there's the plugins. And the plugins is the core part of what we're talking about today. Uh, and it's really broken down into like three or four main components, in my opinion. Uh, but the unfortunate part, yeah, it's unfortunate, is that it's written in Java. Um, Java is a little bit harder to pick up on. It's, it's ugly. If you like Java, I apologize, and I'm kind of curious why you do. But it's good. Um, the components have actions and some other things, and then they also interact with the flat API. So just to break down, just to hammer home what the difference is for plugins and scripting. Um, scripting can be written in Python, which is, has to be ran on the Jython interpreter, just so it can hook into Java. Uh, or you can write it in Java. And then you also have access to the flat API, so you can interact with pretty much everything that Ghidra offers with scripting as well. Um, and it can be ran from the command line or like an action in a plugin. So if you have scripts that you already use and you have this automation layout that you already do when you reverse engineer a binary, um, you can actually call them via your plugins, which may help you automate some of the manual things that you do now. And then plugins are written solely in Java, like I said, um, but it allows for a lot more in-depth use than scripting does. So you can have things that keep state throughout your analysis. 
Um, you can have uh, graphical user interface portions of things that maybe you want to display it to a user and give more context or something like that. And then they can also be built and distributed instead of a script. So the, the build system is Gradle if you've ever used it. I'm sorry, it's, it's difficult. Um, but the nice thing is Ghidra provides the framework to get you up and running with it without having to know too much about how it works. Um, and the reason why being able to build and distribute it is better than the scripts, in my opinion, is because when you build and distribute, it basically archives it into a jar file, and then you just drag that into Ghidra and you get to install it and you're up and running. Um, however, with the script, you need to know where the directory that your Ghidra installation is, you need to know where to put it, and then you need to find it in the UI. It's just a little more clunky. And then the fun part, I think, today, um, everyone has opened Ghidra and put in, you know, like a binary or something of a PE or a Mako. Um, but today we're going to do it with Game Boy games. And it's pretty exciting. Um, if you're not familiar with the Game Boy, it was developed by Nintendo. It was originally released in 1989. Uh, it has lots and lots of games to play. And there's actually still games being developed in the indie scene to this day. And then it's still used for leisure and competitive play worldwide. And when I say competitive play, it's like there's huge tournaments with like thousands of dollars on the line. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit, but there's things like speed running, uh, there's competitive Tetris. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things that are really fun. Um, and then furthermore, there's you know small handheld video games. So there's these cartridges and the cartridges are actually what is like we're going to pull apart today. And it's the main, it's the main fun stuff that the Game Boy can do. There is some logic on the console itself, but most all of it lies within the cartridge. Uh, it has a custom 8-bit CPU similar to an 8080 Sharp CPU. Uh, it runs at 4.19 millihertz, and then it has a ultra-realistic 160 by 144 pixel display. And then I would be amiss if I did not mention that a lot of the work for reverse engineering the Game Boy and getting all of this stuff, Nintendo did not release it. If you're very familiar with Nintendo, they don't like people pulling apart their things or looking into what they do. Um, so there's a lot of resources, and it might be a little difficult to read on the with the, the colors, but basically, there's, a, there's four repos by a person that goes by the pseudonym of Gekio on GitHub. And there's GB Research, which is really just the, like, the get started guide. It links to other things. Uh, there is Ghidra Boy, which is a decompiler plugin for Ghidra, which we leverage. And then there is the Pandocs, which is just like, if you use Pandocs before, it's like markdown formatted documentation that's really easy to read and export. Um, and then there's the CTR, which is the complete technical reference. So if you want to read a 200 to 300 page report about everything that the Game Boy has ever done, you can also do that. I didn't, I just went through for the things I needed, but if someone does read the whole thing, I'd be, be curious. Um, as for the cartridge itself, there's some information that we need to know before we start reverse engineering. So the first thing, oh, sorry. Uh, the first thing is that each cartridge has a header. So much like a PE file, a Mako, anything really, uh, it needs to have a header so the console knows what to do with the information and the, the actual binary. Um, so the first thing is the entry point, and then we'll, we'll go through everything. Uh, but it contains information about the game, and we want that information. So how do we build that out? How do we get it? Uh, and we're going to break down each part of the header. So the first thing is the entry point. That's just, you know, the console automatically goes here, and then we start from there. Uh, there's then the Nintendo logo. Um, and if anyone has ever, like, put a cartridge in a Game Boy, and the logo didn't load right, and then your game didn't load right, that was Nintendo's like first version of DRM slash licensing. So essentially there's the Nintendo logo in byte form on the cartridge and it has to match exactly what the console expects. So if you've ever put in a game and it does throw that error and then the weird sound, that's because like a pin was dirty and a bit was corrupted or something and the logo didn't load properly. Um, and then there's the title and ASCII uh, and then the manufacturer's code. And then from there we have the color Game Boy flag. So the original Game Boy was, was monotone or monochrome. Uh, and then there's the color Game Boy. So this flag indicates that it can use that technology. Uh, there's the new licensee code, which we'll talk about the next slide with the old licensee code. It gets complicated. Uh, there's the SGB flag. So if you've used the Super Game Boy, which is the thing that allows you to play Game Boy games on the Super Nintendo. And then there's the cartridge type. So the cartridge type is interesting because it lets the cartridge know, or lets the console know what hardware it's expecting. So like the memory bank controller, the mapper, uh, how much RAM, et cetera. And then finally, there's we're getting into ROM size, so just how big is the ROM, uh, how big is the RAM chip to support the gameplay, the destination code. So with Game Boys, there were only two destination codes. It was Japan only or overseas and Japan. Uh, that might change now, but when this was created, that's how it is. Um, and then there's the old licensee code. So originally, when the Game Boy was developed and they started giving out uh, licensee codes, 
uh, there was a set amount and then Nintendo had immense success with the Game Boy and they had to re redo the header and take some uh, memory location away from the title. And so if the old look, old licensee code is like 33, then you know to go look in the, the other location for the new licensee code, just because they had so many people that wanted to make their games. And then finally, the last three, uh, the mask ROM version number is essentially, you just have a version of when it was published. So if it was published more than once, uh, it'll probably be you know incremented by one each time. Uh, usually most games only had the initial launch and it was zero uh, and there were no modifications. Uh, there's the header checksum. So it's just the checksum of the header bytes that we just walked through. Uh, we'll actually calculate that and get into it. Um, and then there's the global checksum. And the global checksum is only used by one game ever. Uh, it's, it's there for every single game, but nobody cares about it other than uh, Pokemon Stadium. Pokemon Stadium has a Game Boy emulator built into it. It's on the N64. Um, and you can actually play the games on the N64 um, but they cared about what games you loaded into memory and used for the checksum. So that is the only game in the existence that's known that uses that checksum. And it gets its all own header space. Um, so for this, this is what a header looks like if you were to look at it without any context, any parsing, anything like that. Um, and if someone can read this and actually like call it out, I please don't. But um, it's, this is what it looks like without any context or you know, to the human eye. And it kind of brings to the point of why do we want to parse things? Why do we want to have context to show users? Because if, if I had to parse that out by hand every time and look at this, I would probably stop looking at them and stop parsing them myself. Um, so to write a parser, what do we need to do? We know that each cartridge contains a header. We know the address range. And we also know that it provides information that we want to have things to display to the user. Um, so we really just need to go byte by byte and parse it and see what to do with it. And then our next use case, other than the parser, we have IO ranges. So when you're actually pulling apart the game and you, and you want to start getting into the behavior and pulling apart those behaviors, um, with the custom CPU and instruction set, we know that there will be certain instructions that read and write to certain addresses, and that's how that interacts with the hardware. So if I were looking at a game, I could memorize all of these offsets and know that it's interacting with IO or hardware, or we can you know, write something that automates that for us and tells us when we're looking at it instead of having to you know, constantly look back at documentation and all of that. And we'll get into it a little bit more, but that's, that's our second main use case. And now the, the fun part, we're actually gonna get to talk about the plugin and, and how this can be used. And the main point that I wanna drive home before we go in, just because this is about the Game Boy, it doesn't have to be about Game Boy games. If you have any automated or any manual workflow that you do every time, Odds are with Ghidra, it can probably be automated thanks to that flat API and, and how everything's laid out. So for writing a plugin, what do we need? Uh, you need a whole lot of Java. Uh, unlike scripting, which can be written in Java or Python, uh, you need to use uh, Java. Uh, there's a bit of Gradle, and Gradle's the build system. Uh, we'll, we'll get into it a little bit, but it's, it's not too complicated. You just need to hit build. Everything else is taken care of for you with the files provided by Ghidra. And then you need a lot of patience to read a lot of docs. If you've ever interacted with Java docs, it's awful, it's really hard to read, it looks really old, uh, navigation is a pain, but it's a good skill to have. You just have to persevere. Um, and the, the patience is what's required for that. Uh, as for writing the actual plugin, we don't have to start from like zero. We don't have to start from zero lines of code and learn how to build everything up. And Ghidra is really good about that because we can hit the ground running and start iterating almost immediately. So Ghidra provides quite a few examples for us. Um, there's plugin examples, there's scripting examples, there's a whole lot of things. And these are located, so wherever you extracted your, your Ghidra installation, uh, and then extensions, and then Ghidra. And then as for writing the actual plugin, the things that we need, you need to use Eclipse if you want things to be easier. Um, if you've ever written any Java, you've probably used like IntelliJ or something like that, which is a lot nicer. But, uh, Eclipse is not, but you know the plugins that we get to leverage from it are beneficial. Um, there's Ghidra Dev, which is the plugin that Ghidra releases that allows us to generate skeleton files and you know, get us to iterate quickly instead of starting from zero. Um, the other thing that Ghidra Dev provides is we can actually debug. So we can spin up a Ghidra instance with our plugin and we get all of the debug logging and we can see things change in real time. So we know if we're on the right track when we're developing. And as for leveraging Ghidra Dev, it is bundled with every Ghidra um, installation. So it's extensions, Eclipse, Ghidra Dev in the directory wherever you installed Eclipse, or sorry, installed Ghidra. Um, as for working with the UI, I will be the first to say I don't know how to program UI UX. None of my opinions about UI and UX should be trusted. Um, I do things 
that are on the back end with data, I, I don't do UI and UX. But there are plugins that come with Eclipse that actually allow you to build out things really nicely. Uh, and one thing is called Window Builder. And I actually discovered this like more than halfway through when I was developing this plugin. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the result before I discover this plugin. Um, but it allows you to basically like what you see is what you get in editor. So you drag and drop and then it writes the code for you and then you can change the values that you need. It's super nice. Um, and this is my first UI attempt and you can laugh if you want, it's okay. Um, it's really bad, right? You, you get nothing. Um, I, I didn't know how to do UI UX uh, and thankfully I found the plugin because I don't think this talk would have went well if everything looked like this. Um, and if you're frustrated with Java or with the plugins or with the UI UX, other people have been too. Um, there's actually been a lot of uh, animosity in the community about why Ghidra is written in Java and Swing. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to say that you shouldn't talk out about it, but I will say that this account complained about it. Their GitHub account no longer exists, and the NSA locked the conversation down. So I'll allow you to draw your own conclusions from that. Um, but if you want to keep your GitHub account, maybe don't say anything. Um, so now we're going to dive into the actual like three or four plugin components that we that I feel are important. Uh, three of them are things that you need. One of them is something that I think you should add because it makes everything else a lot easier. Um, so the plugin component is where you actually define the plugin to Ghidra. It allows you to initialize all of the things. So you want to tell Ghidra that this plugin exists. That's where you do it. Um, you give it like the name of what you want to call it, uh, and you also give it like where's my help information. Uh, and then the other thing that's useful in this is right at the start, we talked about how you can extend behaviors and build upon things that were already built. So with my plugin, I did not want things to start until I loaded a binary into memory. Um, otherwise it would crash and I didn't want to handle that. So I just made it load after. Um, but essentially what you can do is you can override the function. If you're not familiar with Java, you just kind of say, do this on top of that. Um, and then I initialize my API and, and we get into it. Uh, and you can see here that flat program API is the API that we mentioned earlier. Um, I initialize a Game Boy helper, which we will get into. And then I also spawned the provider, which is what we're going to talk about next. Uh, the provider is all the pretty things, or in my case, the things that show up on the screen that probably aren't pretty. Uh, it's where you define the layout, the GUI, uh, that sort of stuff. You also initialize actions and callbacks here as well. So if you're not familiar with like callbacks and, and what those are, it's if an action happens, you define what happens when that action happens. So it's you give it a function or you give it a behavior that you want to happen when that thing is initialized. Uh, and this is hard to see, but the, the nice thing is all of this, there are examples of, and you can iterate quickly. So in the example, they initialize callbacks and then you can build what you want from them and have them do things. Uh, so like, for example, the, the one on top is I want it to parse the header. And then the one on bottom is I wanted to calculate and verify the checksum. And these are really easy to lay out um, because of the examples that we have. But without the examples, I would have had to have scraped through, I don't know, hundreds of pages of documentation on, on Ghidra. And that's, that's not any fun. Nobody wants to do that. So what I'm saying with this is you should definitely leverage the examples. There's plenty of people that have written plugins. There's plenty of examples written by uh, Ghidra themselves. You should use them to your advantage. It's not stealing, it's borrowing, and everybody does it. Uh, as for docking actions, this is another integral part. We just talked about actions. Um, they're actions that trigger when something happens. So when a state changes, uh, when a button is clicked, you can even do other things like if a certain byte at a certain location is this value, trigger this action. So you know you can you can have really specialized layouts, um, and that's that's really cool. Um, it's small functions that can call other things. And the, I think the, the GIF is loading. Yeah, okay, cool. So those are the three that I've defined for it. You don't have to have them be buttons. You can have it be any type of behavior you want. Like even if it's something that you wanna call like a minute into loading, you can do things like that. Um, and this is just another docking example. Um, all of this code, I, I know it's hard to read from up here, but all of this code is on GitHub and you're more than welcome to pick it apart as, as you want to. Um, and then the helper component is not something that is built in. A helper component is something that I wrote so I didn't have to have complex things all over the place. So helper components let you abstract things. It lets you have the complicated things be in a specific part of the program and everything else be simple. So you keep state, you perform calculations, you do the dirty work in the helper component, 
And then you leverage it to make things simpler and repeatable. Like if you have something that's complicated and you call it more than once, it should probably be in the helper component. I'm not gonna get into like clean code and repeatable code because that's silly, but uh, abstract things as you need, it makes it, it, makes it easier for you. Um, and as you can see, I, I tried to make it as easy as possible. So when I'm getting all of these things to parse and I need to extract the information, um, I just, I set up a bunch of hash maps uh, and I have from integer to string, from string to string. So depending on like what I have parsed, I can extract the information and have it in a human readable format. Um, if you don't know what a hash map is, it's just a key value store where the keys have to be unique. Um, and then when I initialize my helper, I build all of those maps. So that way the program can leverage them as you go. Uh, I build one for the, the header. So like these bytes are in this location, the address space. Uh, I build the licensees. So like if you have a hex value, you have a string value that matches, things like that. And you'll notice a pattern with the hash maps as we go on. Um, it does make things simpler. So this is my helper class. As you can see, I have things like get program name, get path, um, anything like get licensee is a pretty complicated one. There's like, you know, 15 lines of parsing. Um, if I wanted to do that in each instance of my plugin, I would have to write that code again or copy and paste it, you know, et cetera. That's error prone. It makes it difficult to manage because if you change it in one place, you'll have to go change it in the other. What you want to do instead is actually abstract it out and just call it when you need it. And this keeps it a lot cleaner, right? Like in my actual plugin, I'll be able to go just see get licensee. And I know that it's getting the licensee code and I don't have to worry about the error handling or anything else because I handled it once and it stays. And then remember that parser we needed? I, this is the same Pokemon um, ROM header that I showed with the who's that Pokemon screen. Uh, it was Pokemon Yellow. I don't know if anybody could read it or try to translate it, um, but it's Pokemon Yellow for the Game Boy. Um, as you can see here, even if we ran strings on the binary, we would be able to, you know, grok some context from it, but there's still a lot of things that we don't have context for. And that's why this parser is so helpful. Um, to parse it, again, we get to leverage that flat API. So we basically get a byte at a certain uh, pointer to an address in memory. And all of this is provided by Ghidra. So you call the flat API, you say, I'm going to give you an integer. This is the address it's at, convert it to an address and get it. Um, and to parse all of it, it's really simple. What I had is I had a hash map of the addresses. I had, uh, you know, it starts here, ends here. And then I just had a loop that iterated through all of it, grabbed those bytes and sorted it out. And this is the, you know, the beginning of it. So we can see that things are being organized. It's starting to become clearer. However, it's still a bunch of bytes and we still have context to glean from that. Uh, so converting the bytes information, how do we get all that context? Because it needs to be stored somewhere, right? Um, and if anyone is good at Java and like knows how to initialize hash maps without having to do this, please come talk to me and tell me how to do it. Um, this looks awful, um, but it works. Um, so I initialize the hash maps with the values. You can see like Nintendo, Capcom, uh, et cetera. And then from there, we, ha we have other information that we can, um, we can glean, like the, the hardware type and all of that fun stuff. I wasn't kidding when I said hash maps are the entire thing. It, it really is. Um, and then, so now that we parse everything and we have that information, uh, we can actually calculate the, the checksum and validate it against the checksum that's provided with the ROM. Uh, so this is when I found out about the window builder. As you can see, this doesn't look terrible, I hope. Um, so it's the given checksum, which would be the one from the, the header. And then there's the calculated checksum, which I calculated. Um, and the, the algorithm to compute the checksum is, is not difficult. You start at zero uh, and then you subtract the checksum from itself and then minus one. And then you go through all of it and then you get the lower 32 bits and you compare. Uh, and luckily I obviously loaded a ROM that was legally obtained and uh, checked the checksum and it was valid. Uh, and I will say, I'll go back real quick. I wanna brag that uh, I did program. So if it is invalid, it goes red instead of green. I just had to point that out. Uh, so if we know the information is good, that means it matches. We can do what we want with it. Um, and this is where we can start displaying information to the user or to yourself and get that context without having to do all of that manually. So for instance, with Pokemon Red, it, the title is Pokemon Red. The license is Nintendo Research and Development 1. There are two. I did not look into why there are two. I don't know if it was two different buildings, two different like managers. I don't know. Uh, Nintendo won't tell you. Uh, the destination code is overseas only. Uh, so this was not intended for the, the Japanese market. This one was... Uh, overseas only. Does anyone know what the Japanese market version of Pokemon was called when it was first released? Pocket Monsters. Um, so that's why they, it was a, overseas only. 
Um, and then the ROM size is one megabyte. And then we get uh, the beefier cartridge type of memory bank controller three and then RAM and battery. Um, so everyone's probably heard of Tetris, I hope. Maybe if not, that's okay too. Um, but the licensing stories for Tetris is a nightmare. If you haven't read about it, I highly encourage you to read this book or watch the, uh, the Apple TV series. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because there's a lot of versions of Tetris. They were licensed to a lot of different people. Um, only some of them are important in terms of collector's eyes. I don't know why. Well, I do know why for the one on the right. So the right image on the left side is called the Minuet version. And that was published or licensed by Bulletproof Software. And it has a different soundtrack and that's it. And everyone, because of the different soundtrack, it's in like a slightly different key. This one is worth hundreds of dollars and all the other ones don't matter. Um, so this is why, you know, if you're a game collector and you want to figure out if your copy's legit, you know, you can actually dump the ROM from the cartridge, validate that it matches um, and, and get your information from there. Um, the other one is competitive. Like you probably want your competitive players to be using the same version of the cartridge, right? You don't want someone to have a different version and it'd be like two milliseconds faster on drop time because you're in a disadvantage. Um, yeah, I'm a Tetris competitive nerd. I watch it a lot. So it's, it's fun to, to look into it. Um, there are various versions. This one is slightly different. You can see that the hashes are different. So we know that the content is different, um, but we can also see that the ROM version is different. So things like that are things that we can glean and we can actually pick up on relatively quickly. Um, and this is true for any type of binary, right? Like you'll be able to see that like the number of imports are different, the number of exports are different when comparing between two binaries. And things like this are things you can automate to quickly glean context and, and use these in your workflows. Uh, the next use case is IO. So I showed you that IO map uh, a little bit ago. We're actually going to look into that now. So when you look at the instruction set, you can kind of see offsets and addresses, right? But you don't know where it's writing to, you don't know what it's writing from, et cetera. Um, the nice thing with the plugin, this one was pretty quick. Once we got parsing done, we can, we can start adding cooler features. It can go from this, which has no instructions, to actually, you see on the right, uh, those are comments inserted by the plugin. So you can automate adding comments to the code that give you the context and the cool things um, so you can continue to iterate quickly. So in these, in these, these examples, uh, SB is when serial transfer data is occurring. Um, there's also like LCD, uh, the sound, anything like that. You can actually see all of that depending on the addresses that it writes to or reads from. Um, and again, hash maps again, because I don't know how to do it any other way in Java, um, but it's mapping instructions to hardware. So I give it the addresses and then I say, if it's that address, this is what it's doing. Uh, and this is the code to actually do that. So this one is probably the most complicated example uh, in the plugin. We get every reference, or we get every instruction. We check if it has a reference from it. And then we go through all of those references and check if those references match the offsets. Um, because if you just check the reference without calculating the offset, you don't know if it actually talks to the IO or not, because it's, it's a relative number. Um, and then after that, you basically start a transaction with the database. And what that means is you just tell Ghidra, I'm going to write to this. Please don't touch it until I say so. That's all it means. Um, and then you add the comments so you can see the get current program, get listing, get code unit, add the comment. Um, and we util utilize our hash maps here. And then once you have those, you are good to go. And you say, I'm done with this. You can save it, can carry on what you were doing. Uh, so this is what the finished product looks like. Uh, you can see in the bottom left, the Game Boy game analysis, um, little like window prompt. And this is what the user could see and then open it up. Uh, and then once you open it up, you get access to all the cool behaviors and all of those things. Um, and for the, the end of the talk, I wanted to go into just some games that were either special to me when I was growing up and playing Game Boy games or ones that I figured everyone has played at some point. Uh, so Pokemon Red, you know, Pokemon Blue, Red, Yellow. Uh, that was the first Pokemon game on the Game Boy. Uh, that's, this is the header information for it. Uh, we have Kirby's Dream Land, which in the actual ASCII title is Kirby Dream Land. It's not possessive. Um, not that that matters, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, and then... The next one, we have Batman the Animated Series. So I was a big fan of Batman the Animated Series. I played it a lot. Uh, and the one thing that I thought was really interesting, um, there's no licensee. Like, I don't remember as a child who licensed the game, but it's just missing from the header. It's not a valid value. So I don't know if I got a corrupted version, if I got like a bootleg I don't know. I don't know why it's there, but I thought it was interesting. Um, and then finally, to wrap up, full source code. It's available on GitHub. If you have anything that you want to change about it, if you want to delete all of it and you thought this was silly and you want to write it to actually go on real binaries, you can do that. Um, it's uh, github.com slash latonis slash GB analyzer. Uh, it's all open source. You can do what you want with it. You can fork it. If you want to add a pull request and introduce new behavior, you're more than welcome to. 
Um, and then finally, the one other thing that I felt was beneficial to the community at large is that the build system and distributing is a little finicky if you don't have it like ready to go and, and you're not familiar with it. So in that repo, if you look at the GitHub workflows, uh, there's a utils file that basically you just put it in the GitHub repo and every commit, it will package it and build it for you and upload it as a distribution. So if you, this is something that you can use for if you want to distribute something internally in your enterprise artifactory store, you know, artifacts, wherever they're stored. Um, you can use this and have it upload there and then whoever your REs are or, or what have you, they can leverage these plugins really easily. Uh, and then I know QR codes are kind of blah, but uh, it's there if you want to scan it. Otherwise, it's github.com slash Latonis slash GB Analyzer. And I'll leave it there just in case anybody wants to scan it or take a picture. Okay, uh, that's, that's it. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you have them.